And I think that most pastors have a very low view of the place of preaching. They don't think much of it, and therefore they don't do much with it. And that's a tragic mistake. Personally, I think that the world can be transformed by the preaching of God's Word. I really, truly do. The issue, as I see it, is God speaks through his called servants. And when I stand to preach, it's not as if I'm a tired old man. I'd feel a lot better if I could just stay home in my easy chair. Or I've preached all these years. I think it's time I had a long rest. No, no. When I accept an invitation to preach, I see myself as God's spokesman. Now, I don't think God needs me. I think he could speak right out of heaven and not use men at all. But for reasons that he hasn't explained to me, I believe he does speak through men. And I believe that I'm one of those that he speaks through. So when I prepare to preach, I'm thinking, I don't have any word of my own to give. I don't have any portion of the scripture that I'm placing a self-requirement. I'm determined to preach through 1 Corinthians, and I'm not going to quit. I'm I'm going to preach through 1 Corinthians if it costs me the entire congregation. No, I don't think that way. I think God has given me this appointment to preach. I want to find out what he wants to say to the people. So my search is right there to discover what the mind and the heart of God is for those to whom I will speak at that time. And when I stand there, I don't think, well, this is a 35-minute allotment of time. I'll, I'll blow 30 of it on jokes and incidences from last night's movie. No, I think I got 35 minutes in which to speak what's on the heart of God. I don't dare waste a single one of those minutes. I want to speak exactly what God has given me to speak. So the heart of what I'm saying is I think that the vast majority of preachers that I know see their responsibility as a human responsibility. Some fritter it away because they don't pay much attention to it, just like they fritter away the day. But some don't see it that way at all. Some see it as God called me to speak, he gave me this opportunity. Now, I've got to convey to the people what's on the heart of God. And so the whole sermon then has that uh, as uh, the quality. And then, uh, secondly, I would say there's the realization. Well, I'm a mere man speaking to mere men. Nobody's going to pay any attention to what I say. Now, I could take it at that and say, oh, well, sermons have a minimum of usefulness. It's my job. I'm being paid to do it. I'll do it. Or I could say, I don't have any capacity to affect these people, but God does. And if I'm his instrument, then I'm going to let him be the one that has the influence. He can use my mouth, my lips, but he's the one that's going to have to speak. And so I don't go having said to myself, well, I've spent 12 hours in the study going over this text. I think I have it pretty well. No, that's, I, I don't neglect that part of the preparation, but that's the minor part of the preparation. The major part of the preparation is not getting ready the words to say. The major part is getting ready the heart to be an instrument that the Holy Spirit uses. And so the preparation of the soul, I honestly believe that our impact is far greater in what we are 
than in what we do. And that if I am God's man, and I can stand in the pulpit as God's man, and I don't say to myself as I stand there, well, I frittered away the whole week, and <laughs> I know this is going to be a waste of time. No. No, I, I, I stand there realizing I'm here by divine appointment to speak God's heart, and that's what I want to do. And I'm prepared for him to say or do anything. Honestly, I think what we have in the so-called evangelical church is vastly more men who teach than who preach. Uh, but, but the story is a very informative and significant one. Uh, the, the man of whom uh, I spoke at that time and, and will speak now was the leading theological bookseller in England. A wonderful man, but not a Christian, he operated what we would call a closed shop. The zoning in his area did not permit an open shop, so he maintained this very extensive theological collection for sale, but you could only view it by appointment, and it, there was no drop-in trade. And over a period of years, we became, I would say, good friends. And uh, there was always that distinction because because of the nature of the situation, I would always stay with he and his wife whenever visiting there. And uh, so we had many, many conversations at the dinner table. And I had discovered over the years that uh, I could converse on any theological subject and he could outdo me by a long ways because he was vastly more th knowledgeable theologically than I was. But I could not speak to him about a spiritual matter because he would shut me right off just like that. And his wife would engage in a spiritual conversation, but he would not. Then to my absolute astonishment, he phoned me at one time and said he was coming to the States and uh, he would like to spend some time here with us and would be, we would be willing to receive him. So I thought, well, praise the Lord, there's been a change. And uh, when I picked him up at the O'Hare Airport, uh, he said, I want you to know uh, the significant reason behind this trip. He said, I have come to listen to some of the great preachers in America. And I was just shouting hallelujah in inwardly, thinking, oh, what a wonderful thing. But then I quickly discovered it was the same as it had been. We could talk about anything theologically, and he could outdo me, but I could not get him uh, to think or speak at all of anything spiritual. So we had this very, very pleasant time with him. He's a lovely man. I, I liked him a great deal. He's passed on uh, since that time, but... Uh, uh, he was a very gracious guest, and we just appreciated having him uh, a great deal. And then he went on about his uh, itinerary. Well, not very long thereafter, I was back in England and uh, spending a portion of the time on book purchases, and I was with him. And so at the dinner table, I said to him something like this, I would like to ask about your experience in listening to the great preachers in America. Now, he's quite a large man with huge hands, and he balled up his fist, and he gave the table a whack. He said, I never heard a single preacher in America. And I said, what was the matter? Did you take sick? Were you unable to complete your itinerary? And uh, absolutely not. I went to every place I intended, and then he balled up his fist again, gave a wallop again, and this time everything leapt in the air, and I was afraid the table would actually crash underneath the pound he gave it. He said, you don't have teacher, preachers in America. All you've got is teachers. So then naively I said to him, in your opinion, what is the difference between teaching and preaching. And again, his great indignation and power, he said, it's not a matter of my opinion. It's an absolute fact. 
To teach is to inform. To preach is to move. You don't have preachers. You've got teachers. That conversation was a wonderful help to me because it became then a central issue. Not that I hadn't thought of it before, but I hadn't seen it quite as clearly and distinctly before. And I began then to pay close attention to what I was hearing and seeing among uh, our better-known preachers. And, and I found that in, in most cases, what he said was exactly the case. And he described it something like this. He said, uh, when the teacher stands up, the congregation is here, and when he sits down, the congregation is still here. But when the preacher stands up, the congregation is here, and when he sits down, the congregation is there. The congregation has been moved from where they are to where they belong, and that's true preaching. And that's very worth consideration on the part of all of us because so many of our brethren seem to feel that if they can study the passage completely and have a good analysis and understanding of the passage and can interpret to the congregation what the passage says, that they've preached but I've seen so many times that one can fully understand the passage and perhaps even describe it with adequacy and interpret it with a measure of accuracy. But if the congregation is right where they were, then no preaching has occurred. And certainly the great task of the preacher is to be that spokesman of God who knows the heart of God and who conveys that heart to the people and moves the people from where they are to where they belong. And that is so lacking in the church today and so needed. Oh, wouldn't it be a thrilling thing if every time you went to church you found yourself closer to the Lord when you left the church than you were when you went there. But instead, many of us, when we sit and listen to the preachers, are saying to ourselves inwardly, most of us have the grace not to say it outwardly, but we're saying inwardly, will you hurry up and say something? Do you realize I've got three minutes left, and if you don't grab hold of that and do something, it's going to be too late. And lo, you leave, and nothing has been said. So I think that's a very powerful truth that, that needs to be understood and acted wisely upon. Mm -hmm.